Good morning. Man, I'm glad to see you here. Glad our live stream crowd has joined us today. Hey, I want to say a word. I want to say two words before we dive into the teaching today. Here's the first one. Um, our worship team, they're pretty awesome, aren't they? I mean, we appreciate them, and man, we appreciate their, their commitment to excellence, but their love for the Lord, we appreciate all of that. And so I'm glad they're leading us, and what a great thing that is. Second thing is, I want to say something about Cinco de Mayo, okay? That's coming up, right? It's coming up very quickly. I want to say this to you. So a lot of us are last-minute responders to things, right? There's first responders, then there's last responders, Right? We tend to be the last responder type of uh, culture. But last year, Cinco de Mayo sold out. And we had a lot of folks calling in, wanting tickets, wanting to come. And it just sold out because the, you know, the capacity was limited. This year, we've increased the capacity. But I need to tell you, because I, I don't want you to call in like seven days ahead of time and say, oh, I want a ticket. Because, I mean, we sold out to where it's like 10 days before the event. So get your ticket today. You can do it right out here in the lobby. Make sure you see uh, Pastor Kayla there at the table and she'll take care of you. It's a great event. It supports the Village Norristown, which one of the things we're trying to work on is we're trying to get back to our pre-COVID days where we had, you know, we had about 60 children that, uh, that we cared for on a daily basis down in Norristown. And right, we gave them uh, extra education and, and all sorts of different levels, but a great community and a great way to out, uh, reach out. And in fact, if you're interested, if you can read, how many of you here say, I can read? And you can smile. Can you smile? If you can read and smile, um, man, you can volunteer at the Village Norristown. So, and in fact, when you go to get your ticket, ask Kayla about that, because that's really the core element to us uh, getting back to uh, our pre-COVID days is, is reinvigorating that volunteer team, right? We all got a little lazy during COVID, but nevertheless. But So this Cinco de Mayo, you're going to have great food great authentic food. You're going to have a great program. Uh, there's been over, there's been over 90 some uh, people that have, and businesses, uh, 80 businesses in Norristown that have committed uh, uh, to, uh, that have given to the silent auction. So there's going to be all sorts of opportunity, great fellowship that night. And, uh, and so let's be a part of that. Let's come out and support it in a fun and exciting way. So get your ticket today for Cinco de Mayo. Don't wait. In fact, there's a special. There's a special for tickets today only. If you purchase two tickets, special today, we will give you two tickets only today. So keep that, keep that in mind. So special for Cinco de Mayo. But hey, so we're involved in our series, Victorious Secrets. And what Victorious Secrets is about, is it's about the tools that God gives us for victorious living. So I want you to think about that for a minute. God gives us multiple ways in which we can find victory in him in life. Last week, we talked about prayer. This week, we're going to talk about what a tool the scriptures are to help us find victory in life. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, I just pray that you would pour all of that out upon us. I pray that even as we talk about your scriptures, we would see the value for transformation in life that you deliver to us through your word. So Lord, teach us today. Create a thirst within us to, uh, to participate in your word on a regular basis. We love you, Jesus. We praise you in your name. Amen. Now, it seems odd, I'm going to say this right for the start, it seems odd that we would put the Bible on a list of secret things. That seems really odd because the Bible is definitely not a secret. For instance, did you know 87% of U.S. households have a Bible? 87%, right? That's almost 9 out of 10 houses and apartments and condos, they have a Bible within them. Did you know it only takes about an average sale of about 10,000 copies a week to become a New York bestsellers list? A New York Times bestsellers list takes about 10,000 sales a week. Do you know how many Bibles are sold in an average week in the U.S.? 384,615. Is that incredible? 
I mean, man, the Bible is a New York bestseller like, like 380 times or 38 times or whatever the math is. Right? I mean, it, it's just, and that's on a daily basis. There are 20 million Bibles purchased every year in the United States alone. Like it is the historical best seller of all time. Right? So, so even to list the Bible as a, as a secret is, a, is like just really an odd thing when when, when nine out of 10 people own it, and right? Who hasn't ever heard of the Bible? I mean, so it's hard to list it as a secret, but I do think that sometimes what may be secretive about it, or maybe we act like we don't know this about it, is the increased quality of life that is contained within the scriptures that God provides to us. And in fact, I'll say the reason we act like that's a secret or we act like we don't know it is because there was a survey taken in 2021 and it, and it basically said this. It said 63% of the U.S. population declare themselves Christian, right? They say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian, 63%. But only 11% of the U.S. population reads their Bible on a daily basis. Think about that. 63% of everybody who lives in the U.S. says, I'm a Christian, but only 11% say they read their Bible on a regular routine of a daily basis. And over 29% say, I don't read my Bible at all. I don't read it at all. I mean, right, 90% of our homes have a Bible in it, but, but, right, but, but they're like, I don't read it at all. I don't pick it up. I don't open it up. I don't read it. I mean, I don't, I'm not talking about once a month, or I'm not talking about once a year. I'm talking about I never read the Bible ever. So, I mean, the results of that is 86% of Christians deny themselves the daily understanding for victory that's found in its pages, right? 86% of people that say, man, yeah, I follow Jesus. They, they just don't take it in on a daily basis. And they, and they lack the, the ability to be victorious in life because they don't receive this wonderful tool that God has provided for them. In fact, 52% of Christians deny themselves completely, right? Like, so I don't know how many here today. Let's say, there's, let's say there's 350 people in the room. That would mean, right, that that would mean that right, 175 of us, we never, we never open the Bible. Like, right, we just deny ourselves the, the word that, that is given to us for victory in life. And I was thinking, so, so what are we really denying ourselves of? Like, what do we die, deny ourselves of when we don't receive the word? Well, one of the things we deny ourselves of is God's best life for us. Yeah, we deny ourselves God's best life. Second, Second Timothy 3.16, it says this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, this is where I get the life from. When it says all scripture is God-breathed, you know what the Bible teaches us? The Bible teaches us that life is found in breath. Life is found in breath, right? And, and in fact, you know this, you stop breathing, what's gonna happen? You're gonna die, right? Life is found in breath. If you go to Genesis, you go to Genesis chapter one and two, and it talks about God creating, and he creates Adam. What does he do for Adam? He breathes his breath into Adam, and he becomes a living being. So this idea that it is God-breathed means that it delivers life to us, right? I mean, I mean that's why the author of Hebrews says that the scripture is living and active. It's where we get our breath. It's how we breathe. God breathes life into us through his word. And, and then one of the, another thing we deny ourselves does is the, vis the visibility of our path ahead. Like we walk in darkness if we, don't, if we don't participate in the scripture. Like if we don't know the scripture and receive it and, and write it, we don't, we don't keep that lamp burning in our lives, man, our path becomes cloudy. That's how the psalmist wrote, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path because it shows us. Man, when we read the scriptures, we're not surprised or, or we're not shaken or it makes us aware we step where we ought to and we don't step where we ought not to when the scriptures are part of our lives on a regular basis. And then we lose the ability to, to judge our thoughts and our attitudes. I mean, I mean think about this. 
The author in Hebrews says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So the scripture judges us. All right, it judges us about what we're thinking. It judges us about how we're acting, right? It deals with our attitudes. I mean, and maybe that's one reason why we often avoid the scripture is that we're, our attitudes are in a, in, in a bad place. And so we open up the Bible and the Bible goes, you got a bad attitude. And you're like, whoa, right? It, it judges us. It helps us see, right? It helps us understand even ourselves. It shows us the error in our thoughts, the scripture does. Jesus says this, this is Jesus's words in Matthew 22. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You're in error because you don't, you don't know the word. You have to know the word to, to, to not live in error. And then, then ultimately we deny ourselves spiritual sustenance when we don't receive God's word into our lives. And again, Jesus's words, remember when he's out and he's being tempted and the devil says, hey, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus' response was, man does not live on bread alone. But let me tell you what mankind lives on. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's word is the feast for our soul. His word is. And man, we starve ourselves like we starve ourselves spiritually if we are not receiving and taking in God's word on a daily basis. You know, now, now I don't know. I, I'm just going to toss a question out. How many of you here today plan to eat? Do you plan to eat? How many of you have already eaten? Come on, let's be honest. I mean, I ate. I ate this morning. I had, I had some oatmeal, some chia seeds in it, walnuts, Greek yogurt, blueberries, I don't always eat that well. That's the only reason I'm telling you what I ate, because I ate so well, right? You're like, man, that dude is so healthy. Yeah, no, that's not true. I had a bowl of ice cream before I had my oatmeal, but, you know, just total transparency. But anyhow, but right, but, but I mean, we all plan to take in physical food. Why? Because we don't make it without it, but also because we have this driving hunger, right? That's is created in us for food. Our spirit is the same way. Man, our spirit has a hunger for God's word, right? And, and, and we starve it if we do not feed it with God's word. We, 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 we lose spiritual sustenance. Now, now, Dora and I were talking about this this week. You know, Dora's my wife. So Dora and I were talking about this week. You know, most mornings, you know, Dora and I wake up, we'll have a cup of coffee together. She's doing her devotions, right? She's, she's reading her Bible and, and doing her devotions and so forth. And, and, and oftentimes we talk about whatever she's, She's doing it in her devotions. And sometime throughout the week, we always talk about what the topic of the message is, right? So I'm telling her, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about God's word as a tool for living. And Dora, and, and I'm a, if you don't know Dora, I'm going to tell you what. She is a, like, an Olympic Bible athlete, you know? I mean, that, that, that lady is, but anyhow. So, so basically, we're talking about it. And she delivers this, this I think, an incredibly practical thought for us. She said this, whenever you talk to most Christians about the Bible, they answer this way. I know what the Bible says. Well, when was the last time you read it? Oh man, I grew up going to church. I had to read the Bible all the time. I know what the Bible says. Hey, do you remember the story when, oh, I know what the Bible says. When you talk to somebody and, and right there in a spot and you go, well, you know, have you looked and I know what the Bible says. And, and, and so she said that you hear that so many times from so many Christians. They already know what the Bible says. And she says, and this is what I think. I think when we so easily shrug off that we know the Bible, so therefore it isn't important to engage the Bible any longer, what happens to us is we try to live life off of Bible reserves. I thought to myself, man, that is really interesting. That at least according to the statistics, most Christians are trying to live their life off of Bible reserves. That somewhere at some time they learned something in the scripture and then 
and then that's kind of it. Or, or they got the gist of somewhat of the story, and, and then they try, to, they, they try to have that be their strength. They try to live off of Bible reserves. You know, some formerly attained knowledge or, or some not fresh or current word in their life. And then she said this. I mean, this is really good. Then she said, do you know that Jesus says that there are factors at work in our world that try to make God's word ineffective in your life? I look back at her and say, say that again. She's like, man, Jesus himself said there are elements in our world that try to make God's word ineffective in our life. And I said, well, where did Jesus say that? And she says, well, he said it in Mark chapter four. You ought to read it. You're the preacher. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom in that thought, right? You know, you're the one that has two degrees and 90 hours of masterwork in all of this, right? Mark chapter four, read it. And so like I went to Mark chapter four and you know what Mark chapter four, the beginning of Mark chapter four is about? It's about the sower sowing his seed. And Jesus says in his story that the seed that he's sowing is the word of God. He's sowing the scriptures. He's tossing it out for everybody to hear all upon the soil. And then he talks about four different types of soil and what happens with that soil when God's word comes out. And here's what he's talking about, the, the soils. He, he talks about, first of all, about birds that, that swoop down and, and grab the seed before it can take root. And he says, the bird is Satan. There is an enemy who sweeps down that tries to take the seed before it can take root in our lives. And then he talks about hard spots that form in the soil. Like a hard spot where, I don't know, something's happened or something's rubbed up against you or something has hurt you and it has formed this callus over you. And, and so God's word is there and, and God's word comes, but it bounces around on this hard spot. And, and because you're hardened, it doesn't take root in you. And then it talks about, it talks about how, um, how many of us have not allowed God's word to be deeply rooted in us. Like this idea that, well, you know, I know God's word, it's up here and da da da, da but, but we've not allowed it, we've, we've not, right, we've not developed it to take deep root in us. So that then when the sun comes out, this is what Jesus says, when the sun comes out, when it gets hot, we shrivel up. And then the final thing is he says is, and, and then there's just the worries of life. You're anxious about this, you're anxious about that, you're worried about this, you're concerned about this, and you're not equipped to deal with it, right? You're not equipped because you don't know the word, but the other thing that happens is then that even further chokes the word out of your life. So like when I read this over, when I read like, like, like the first part of chapter four over, Jesus' story and then his interpretation of it, he basically gives us three things that he says causes God's word not to be effective in us. The first thing he says is there's an enemy. There's an enemy who wants to remove God's word from your life, right? Just wants it to be gone. Your enemy doesn't want you to read it, doesn't want you to look at it because he doesn't want it to be effective in you, right? Well, so, so we have an enemy that's actively working against us. And then, and then it talks about we have a lack of personal development when it comes to the word. Like, like we don't apply ourselves and we don't, we don't have a consistency in our life that allows God's word to, to find itself deeply rooted in us. So when we really need it, there's no root. And it's like, whew, everything like just fries it and burns it up in our lives and, and then it ends up being ineffective. And then basically he said, life itself. Things happen in life. The wear and tear of life itself can wear you out and make God's word a distant mumble, especially if you're simply trying to live on reserves. Like if you don't have a fresh word, like if you don't have a, a new word, if you're not constantly, you know, looking at the word and taking it in, man, it so quickly because of the impact of the enemy and our own lack of, lack of devotion and development to it. And, and, and life itself can, can make all of that ineffective. But then Jesus said, there's another approach to the word and that is to receive it. Man, that's to receive it, that's to develop it, that's to nurture it, that's to participate in it. 
And you know what he says happens to the people that do that? It says God's word exponentially grows in their life. 30, 60 to 100 times multiplied in their life. I mean, I mean that in and of itself was like, like worth the trip in today, in my opinion. I mean, I thought that was a powerful, powerful word. But, but you know, Jesus didn't only talk about God's word at that point. Jesus also reinforces the value of God's word in our, word in our life when he reemphasizes the Shema in the New Testament. Now, now, what the Shema is, is the Shema is kind of like the core foundational teaching of Judaism, right? So it's like the core foundational teaching of the Old Testament. And Jesus reinforces that in the New Testament. But it's found in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9. And it starts off this way. This is how it starts out. Hear, O Israel. Hear. So the first thing you learn about the core teaching is you have to position yourself in a place to hear. Like if you're not putting yourself in a place to, to, to hear God's word, right? If you're not you're putting yourself in a, in a place to hear what God is telling you, Man, I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's no place to go if you're just not going to hear it. Because even the Apostle Paul in, in Romans chapter 10, remember what he said about hearing? He said, faith, faith itself comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. So hear, O Israel, you first have to hear because faith comes from hearing. So, I mean, you want more faith in your life? You want to believe more? Position yourself to hear more in your life. And then it goes on, and this is the Shema. Then it goes on. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So he's basically saying, man, it's just not something to look at. It's something to internalize. We internalize what it is that God says to us. We internalize it. Then he says, impress them on your children. And he, he doesn't mean impress your children with them. You know, hey, look how impressive I am, you know, with God's word. That's not what he means. He means impress them, leave an impression on them. Make, make God's word such a part of their lives that it leaves an impact, that it leaves a mark on them. And then it goes on and says, talk about them. Talk about God's word when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Let God's word be on your lips. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. We know why that is, right? Because it's like, let God's word direct what you do and let God's word impact what you think. Let God's word in. Let it impact what you think and, and let it impact what you do. In fact, when, when, you, when you read the Shema in Deuteronomy and you read when Jesus reinforces it, which he does a few times in, in the Gospels, when you read that, you recognize that Jesus adds an addition to the Old Testament Shema, right? Like, like the Old Testament Shema says, says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. But Jesus, Jesus says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength mind and strength. So like somebody goes, well, so Jesus added the mind. Well, actually he really didn't add the mind. Let me tell you what's happening. This isn't a new concept that Jesus adds to the idea of the Shema, but this is what's happening. This is what's happening in culture. You know, in, in, when, when in Deuteronomy, they were living in a, as they traveled right through the wilderness, as they were forming their, their, their Jewish, as, they, as all this was happening, they were living in a fully Jewish culture. And in Jewish culture, they never separated the mind and the heart. That wasn't their philosophy. The mind and the heart was one, right, in the Jewish mindset. But when the Greeks took over, because now in the New Testament, they're living under the Greek influence, the Greek influence was to separate the mind and the heart, to divide them. I, I mean, that's, that's, that's you, you, I mean, you get why, the, why, why Judaism did not divide them. Because they wanted you to know that what you think impacts your heart. That what you think impacts what you feel. That what you think impacts what you do. Right? That those things matter. Right? 
And, and so they want you to know that there's no separation in their philosophical view of life of a separation between my mind and my heart, right? They're like, no, they are deeply connected to each other, right? What I think impacts what I feel. I mean, that's the way it is. But, but when the Greeks came in, they were like, they separated those two apart. They, they, they made them separate. So all Jesus was doing was speaking to the culture of the day. And when they would say, if, you, if he would just say, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, they'd go, okay. And if he didn't say mind, they would say, well, then, you know, my love for Jesus isn't supposed to impact my thinking. The word of God, his commands are not supposed to impact my thinking. So Jesus is like, no, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He is urgently reminding everybody that there is no separation between what they think and how they feel, that what you think impacts all. And then, then it says, the Shema, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Let your homes themselves declare the victorious words of God. Decorate your house with God's word your door frames, and, 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 and on your gates. I, I don't know if you guys re remember these days. Do you remember these days where, like I grew up in a house where, where we had a family room and we had a living room. And the living room was this room where uh, there was like a bunch of fancy furniture. All the best and most expensive things in the house went in the living room. And then we were never allowed to go in the living room where all the best stuff was. And in fact, I remember that as a kid. We had little dogs when we were growing up. Man, my dad trained them. I mean, they'd run right up to the edge of the living room. And when that carpet changed, they put their brakes on because the dog was never allowed in the living room, right? I mean, the living room is a special status. Are you following me? Did anybody grow up in a house like that? Man, here's this house with all, man, it's beautiful. It's, a, it's, the, most, it's the best looking place in the house and you were never allowed to go in it, right? And, 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 so, and so what would happen is we would have this coffee table, right, in the living room. And on the coffee table, what did we have? A Bible. Oh, yeah, a Bible. And not just any Bible, a 250-pound Bible, right? I mean, it's like, it's like you needed a crane to get the Bible on that coffee table, right? It was huge, right? And it was opened up. And so there's all your best stuff. And in the middle of your best stuff was God's word. There was the Bible opened up. You know, there was only a few times in which we were even allowed to go in the living room. You know when those times were? When we were entertaining, when we had company, right? Our family was over. Then all of a sudden we could all come in the living room and sit on the fancy furniture, not the plastic covered furniture in the family room. And and I, and I think about this. I think about just even the symbolism of that. And I think about the symbolism that, that man, whenever anybody comes over and we're entertaining and we're in the living room, what's at the center of the room? God's word, right there. It's huge, it's big, it's impactful. The symbolism of it. Now, you know, I mean, I, I have to be honest. And I, 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 I'm trying to think. I, I probably have in the last three months opened up a paper book for my Bible. But, but like probably like you, right? My Bible's in my cell phone and my Bible's in my iPad and my Bible's in my computer and my Bible's in, right? I mean, and, 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 and one thing, I'm really happy about that because I'm not carrying around that 200 pound Bible anymore. But, but I mean, it makes it whole, you know, much more convenient. But you know, even, even, even when Abraham was called, right? And I want you to think about this. Even when Abraham was called, right? Abraham was called of God, but Abraham used to worship idols and still he started following God. And you know what he used to do with his idols? Is he would carry them in a satchel. He would put it away. And then whenever he wanted his idol to do something for him, he would get it out, right? So he'd get his idol out and he'd be like, oh yeah, you know, and he'd pray to his idol and make a sacrifice to his idols. And then, you know, after he did all that, he'd pick up the idol and he'd put it away again. You know, there's something powerful about this idea of God's word being present in us and on us. And, but, but I mean, I, I think one of the great tragedies that happens when we deny ourselves the constant input of God's word into our lives and I, and I think this is the true tragedy for us, is we forget our story 
and we forget our words. Do, do you know what I mean by that? Like I have a minor, right? My, my, I, I have, I don't know, I have like 24 hours of, of studying the Greek language, right? You know, the, right, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so, right, going to, and somebody say, hey, can you translate this Greek verse for me? No, I can't. I have 24 hours of, right, college level, you know, work in Greek. And I may be able to pick that out. I might be able to pick that out. I might be able to pick that out. But you know why I cannot translate that? Because I put it away because I don't do it every day. Man, when I was doing it every day, you could hand me a Greek New Testament and I could read out of the Greek New Testament like I read English. But I just don't use it like I used to. I mean, right, there's a bunch of tools out there, there's a bunch of other things, right? but I'm just not reading in the Greek every single day anymore. And when you don't read it every single day, you know what starts to happen? Is you start to forget it. And so now whenever anybody hands me a Greek New Testament or they say, hey, you know, this Greek word, I try to pull on my Greek reserves, which are way less effective than if it were current in my life. And that's what I mean. We forget our story. We forget our story. We forget our words when we don't have this regular intake of God's word into our life. Like, like, like you get our story. Let me tell you what our story is. Here's our story in a very long run-on sentence. But here's our story. God's lavish love overcoming Satan's deception and our own brokenness through Jesus excruciating sacrifice where we are offered miraculous redemption. I mean, that's our story. That is our story. And, 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 and we forget that. We forget what life's about. We forget how deeply God loves us. We forget the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Oh, we know, we know, but we're living off reserves. It's not fresh and alive in our lives. We're not being cut with us down to the joint and marrow when we're not taking it in every day, when we're not receiving it. And, and that impacts us because I, I want you to hear how our story is fleshed out in our lives with the words of the scripture. These are the things we forget. For when we are unlovable, the scripture tells us, See what great love the Father has lavished on you, that you should be called children of God, and that is what you are. Those are our words. It's important that we remember those. For, for when we are brokenhearted, the psalmist writes this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Those are our words. Like we need our words. If we're gonna live in victory, we need, to, we need to know our words and we need to cling to our words and they need to be quickly available for us when times come in which we need them. When we don't know how to pray. Romans chapter eight, the apostle Paul writes this, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us. Man, we need to know that. That when you yourself don't have the words, when you don't know what to ask for, when you don't know how to go before God, you know who does? The Spirit. And he hasn't abandoned you. He does it for you. Is that incredible? Man, there's powerful truth in our words. For when we can't pay our bills. Man, Psalms 50. For every animal in the forest is mine and a cattle on a thousand hillsides. For when we feel alone, because God has said to us, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. For when we're lost, man, when, when Jesus says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. For when we feel like we're at the end of our rope and, and the word tells us, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made strong through your weakness. 
For when we fear death itself, the 23rd Psalm, even though I walk through the darkest valley, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I mean, these are our words. We have this incredible grand story that if we don't take it in, that if we don't receive it, that if we're only trying to live on reserves, we forget them and something else becomes dominant in our lives over our own story, over our words. And you know the purpose of the scripture, right? You know the purpose of the scripture? The written word is supposed to lead us to the word become flesh. Like that's the purpose of it. The purpose of it is ultimately to bring us to Jesus. To say, man, it is the word become flesh that is alive. You are introduced to him and you understand him and you know him in depths because of the written word. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. That growing up in the home that I grew up in, I was asked almost every day. Dave, what'd you read in the Word today? What'd you read in the Word today? What did you read in the Word today? I was asked that almost every day of my life. I mean, I was asked that for years when I didn't even believe it. I didn't believe the word. Right? I didn't believe in, in Christ. And every day, right, every opportunity my father had, right, almost, Dave, what'd you read in the word today? So you guys know, I've told this story before. It's not new. You know what I did? You know what I did, right? I'm 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old, and what is the last thing I want? I don't want to hear my dad's lecture, Right? So you know what I did? I read something. I just, I just read something, right? So I'd be like, really quick, if I knew he was home in the morning and I was gonna run into him, I'd open up my Bible and I'd go, mm -hmm. okay. And he'd come down and he'd go, what'd you read in the word today? Oh, I read something about where Jesus, da, da 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 Oh, that's great, that's fantastic. You know what I mean? And then I didn't get like, like a lecture or what he read, which was way, way, way more than what I read, you know? <laughs> so then I had to listen to everything he read. But, so, but I do that. If he, if he was working a different shift and I knew he was going to be home at night, man, I'd look at him and go, okay, yeah, I got this. And I, and you know what happened one day? It's a crazy thing. This is absolutely crazy. But you know what happened one day? One day I stumbled over this verse, right? And just really quickly trying to have something to tell my dad, John 15, 13. I just stumbled over that verse where it says, greater love has no one than this that one lay down their life for their friend. And so I just read it real quick, and my dad's like, what'd you read today? Oh, I read about great love lays down their life for their friend. And he's like, oh, yeah, Jesus said that about what he's done for us. Man, that's a great word. Only you know what happened? I didn't even believe, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's living and active. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Man, I mean, man, I'm running around with my buddies. I'm doing all the stuff high school kids do. Probably stuff that we all hope our high school kids don't do. <laughs> but I'm doing all that. You know what I mean? And it's like, even when like, I'm, right, I'm there with my high school buddies and we're doing stuff that I don't want to tell you because I don't want you to. But anyhow, but we're doing stuff. And, and, and then all of a sudden it's like greater love. Dave, there's greater love than the friends you're sitting with in this room right now. And I'd be like, where'd that come from? What is that about? So I went back and I read it and I said, I just keep. And I mean, it kept on me, on me, and on me, and on me, and on me until it broke me down. I mean, God's word judged the attitudes of my heart. Right? I mean, man, it just broke me down. Until I came to this place where I was like, Whew, you know what? I think this is true. I'm starting to think that this is right and this is true. And let me tell you something. 
I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, my, I've told you about my dad. I probably talked about way too much, right? Eighth grade education, worked in a steel mill, right? But loved Jesus, absolutely. I think in some sort of weird plot in his eighth grade educated mind, he knew what would happen if he got me to read the word. I think he just knew. So he just said, what'd you read today? 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 The power of God's word, effective in our lives. And man, when we don't receive it, we deny ourselves the victory that's found in the pages within. So, so I thought this morning I, I would give a little bit of a challenge, like at least a few things that maybe we could do to, to, to get God's word into our lives. Like, so I have, I have five options here. You might have better options than these, right? But here's five options. If you're not taking in God's word on a regular basis, you know what you should do? You should download the church app, the app for the church. You can get it in any of the play stores, right? You download the app because inside the app we do have, if you go down to the bottom, there's a little Bible icon. You hit the Bible icon and there is a daily reading plan for the scriptures in it, right? So it's always with you. You know what I mean? It'll take you through the scriptures, right? It's just a daily reading plan. Or you could go to bibleproject.com, you know, on, on, online. And, and you could set it up to, you know, once a week or something, you know, uh, watch, these, watch these videos that teach you about the scriptures. I mean, man, they're, 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 it's, it's great stuff. Or you could, or you could like, like download uh, your, your daily bread, which are short, quick devotionals that, that, that just puts the scripture in your mind. Or, or you could sign up for, listen to this, I think this is a cool name, but you could sign up for right out here at the Connect Group table, binge reading the Bible. Now, you get that, don't you? You get binge. How many of you guys binge watch TV? Yeah, you guys are just it's like, I'm not raising my hand to anything today. <laughs> I'm not cooperating at all. So, but, but yeah, I mean, binge. I mean, I binge watch TV. I can watch, I can watch a whole season in one evening. You know, it's crazy. Sometimes I'll start it and it's three in the morning. I'm like, oh my goodness, I just can't believe I stayed up to three in the morning watching this crazy show. But binge read the Bible. Hey, man, you can just go out here to, 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 to the Connect Group table. Pastor Nick or somebody's going to be there to help you with that. You can sign up for a long-term group where you consistently dialogue about God's Word in your life and the impact of it on others. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. I thank you for the wonderful tools that you give us that help us find victory in you. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful gift of the Scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that we just simply wouldn't own it, own a Bible, but Lord, we would take ownership of putting the word into our lives. And Lord, we believe it will not come back void. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and grace. And may your word internally and eternally impact us. Now, Jesus, Receive what it is that we bring. Your word teaches us some things even about that. Your word tells us that we should never be worried when we give to you because you are Jehovah Jireh. One of your very names is the God who provides. And you provide for us, Lord. And you do ask us for a portion back. You do ask us to join you with all of our talent and and all of our time and all of our treasures. So Lord, receive what it is that we bring. Find us not just to be readers of the word, but to be obedient to it. You're good to us, Jesus. We praise you. We love you. And we pray this in your name. Amen and amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot out of it. If you feel like you need to respond, you can visit fairviewvillagechurch.com slash prayer and you can fill out the forms there and let us know how we can be praying for you. Or you can scan the QR code below and that'll take you everywhere you need to go for next steps. Thanks so much for joining. We hope you have a great week and looking forward to connecting with you.